Culture Interrupted, produced by Cognitive Rise Productions. What is culture? How we observe and celebrate, how we care makes us a people, upholding traditions built from our morals and experiences and values that we all have in common. Culture is how we share in the experience of life. Culture is how we celebrate life. What is happening in the cannabis industry? What are the changes and effects being felt? With regulation upon us, it is imperative that innovators remain compelling in action towards the ultimate goal, which is moving into a realm of highest quality standards and guidelines focus on wellness, harmony, education. Culture Interrupted is honored to present the Dank Duchess. <laughs> My name is the Dank Duchess, but I just go by Duchess. So there's an actual the in the name. <laughs> culture in its many ways that it unfolds is very important because culture is the fabric that envelops everything. You know, um, some people listen to different types of music, you know, and if you only listen to one, you listen to one country song, Big and Rich has one song. It, you're not really part of the culture if you're only listening to that one country bit of country music because you're not aware of the entire genre, the ups, the downs, the different ways that country music can be presented. So if you happen to know one thing, that's like knowing about Blue Dream and thinking you know everything about cannabis. That really does not, um, that doesn't show any effort into um, exploring the culture fully. So culture is super important. Culture is the glue. Culture is the glue that keeps everything together. I was writing an article for Weed World magazine, I write about hash, and it was my, maybe my fourth or fifth article, and it was going to be the Blood, blood Drive by Frenchie, and um, I had procrastinated, I needed to get like the substance and the meat of the article about three hours before a flight that I had during rush hour traffic in San Francisco. So. I really wanted to go to the Marin Headlands. I set out at four o'clock from the East Bay to San Francisco. That was terrible. By the time I got there, I was super frazzled. I was arguing with my husband. And it, was, it just felt like this was going to be the article. It was going to go super badly. I took a few dabs in the car. Um, I kind of was upset about the amount of people, but it's a tourist attraction, right? But I took a few dabs in the car and I said, let's walk up to Hawks Hill from like the bottom viewing area. So it was gonna be quite a long walk. So 15 minutes into it, um, I didn't feel that elation that I like expected that I should feel from having really, really dank hash. But what I did have was total quiet. It was like such absolute quiet in my head that I, realized, oh, you have an anxiety problem. Cause this is what normal supposed to feel like. And so why that's just amazing for me is because after that I was able to make even better informed choices about my cannabis um, regarding how I'm feeling. If I'm feeling down, I'm gonna feel, you know, I want a certain thing, but I know what anxiety feels like just because I had the complete absence of anxiety and that blood drive was a super high CBD bit of hash and that that was amazing for me that was in 2015 and it has totally changed my life like totally changed my life it's not like you're not going to get high if you don't follow certain rules it's nice to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of established traditions with regard to something so with the smoke you know everyone says pass to the left and passing to the left is super important i mean the weed still tastes great to the right, but you pass to the left because people are expecting the weed to be passed to the left, but Chillum gets passed to the right. And you tell people before then because they get a little nervous. It's not supposed to come from the side. Yes, yeah, well, it, it did. Put your phone down. Be in the circle. That's like a, such a major part of it. Being in the circle, wanting to be there, and putting your energy and efforts and mindfulness into being in the circle. So once you're there and no one's going to the bathroom or doing this and that, um, and, and we're about to start it, I like for me, I, uh, I smoke a chillum very often. And I feel, I tell people, if you're going to smoke chillin' with me, you cannot leave the circle. Once we've started, we're here and we're going to experience that until the chillin' is at the end. So it's the willingness of people to 
create this bubble and have that sacred experience with the people with whom you've decided to smoke. So while it's nice to be at a concert and you're passing the joint and it's going wherever, that doesn't really feel like a circle, unless it's a circle of thousands, tens of thousands. But when it's that small little group, four or five, and you're really vibing, and you're vibing at that moment, at that space, not worrying about anyone outside of that, that to me is where the circle's made. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. Don't skip around in the rotation. You're, everyone's supposed to get it. an equal amount of say. Do not light somebody else's joint. Let them light their own joint. Like, don't pick up someone else's joint or blunt and just decide, oh, we're friends. We're just all going to light it. Because for me, if you take one of my uh-ohs, I'm going to flick you in your finger. So there's that. Um, don't wet the end of the joint. I mean, people just have it like this, feel like it's a baby bottle. Don't, don't do that. Nobody wants, your, nobody wants your wet joint. Don't just tell a story forever. I'm good for that. I'm a holder. I am such a holder that at some points, my husband's giving me something else to hold. And literally, I would just continue with the story, just holding a pen. So, you know, for real, I'm such a holder. I'm such a holder, it's so terrible. Um, you know, pass it, keep it going, be positive, and, you know, and, uh, and if you didn't bring anything, you cannot complain about it. You cannot complain in any way, shape, or form. But don't come to the circle without having brought anything, even if you're only bringing a smile. Definitely don't bring any grumpiness. You didn't bring in. You didn't put in. So, well, there's that. Sometimes a second joint comes in because the circle's so big that it's taking kind of long, and then you send in the opposite direction. Otherwise, you know, you could just keep the cycle going. Hey, I have my joint. Oh, keep it going. But if it's like, you know, that Becky over there did not get any, please, let's send the joint that way. It's all about making people feel comfortable, you know what I mean? So again, yes, you want to send it to the left, but like if we're a prison to dogma, then Becky may never get it. It may just keep going right here. Sorry, Becky, I tried. When I first met my husband, he was big into cannabis, and I was 100% anti-cannabis. Nancy Reagan told me, say no to drugs. All I had to depend on was my brain power because I had grown up really funny looking and really just just really, really funny looking. So what I had was my brains. And so I wasn't going to do anything that might <laughs> make me lose my brains, just like Nancy Reagan said. I was a math major in college, and, uh, and I met this guy. And so we were together two and a half years, and I'm berating him about all this weed usage. I mean, I'm really kind of terrible. And then one day, literally the weed spoke to me. It was in a piece of, in a, a nice, a really nice glass shaped like a teardrop. And it almost said, like, just, just have me. So I went with it and I took a, a puff and immediately did some calculus and I realized that they lied. It was that simple. See, I, I really felt literal, like, like suddenly my brain power, I don't even know why I took that jump then, but, but suddenly my brain power would be all gone. I did some difficult calculus right after that. And I said, these people lied. And once I realized how good I felt that first day, because it only took one day, one, one day and one set of puffing, that I was just like, all right, now I'm on this cannabis thing. So I was not cannabis. Like Monday, Tuesday, I was pro-cannabis. And then I was growing within like three months because I was so pro-cannabis that it was costing me a ridiculous amount of money. So then I, I needed to grow, grow weed. I'm an advocate because of the lies. Like literally, it's cruel that Americans, my grandmother has dementia. My grandmother is in New York. And I'll be honest, I was sending before it was legal to be able to do that, sending CBD and THC to my grandmother because there's no reason that she should like feel so terrible in New York, but if she was in California with me, that she'd be doing better. We're all supposed to be Americans, and the fact that it's so fucking unfair, that's why I'm an advocate. Once I realized that they were lying, once I realized that like we could literally save so many people in so many different ways, and they're lying. They're literally lying. And when they're not lying, they're putting a chokehold on the situation. So it's just like, all right, well, you can have it, but only for this situation. Or you can have it, but only this amount. Or you can have it, but only if you look like this. That's like a whole set of bullshit lies. And if we all, all of us, every single one of us who has a mouth to say something can say something, then that lie will eventually die. And that's why I do it. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. Prop 64 w was, was a lot of lies, right? It was a lot of lies. And it's only now that we're seeing how much lies it is. Every, almost everybody that I know in the industry has been negatively affected. Some people have bounced back. 
Some people have bounced back. Um, I don't make hash for, for dispensaries now. I'm a contractor. I was making hash under Bubble Man's name for a while, now I'm making hash for cookies. <clears throat> I'm still the dang duchess, so I, I, like, I, I could see that I wanted to focus on, on my brand, on me learning as much as I can, and then make my brand just a consulting situation because A, I wanted to not be stuck any one particular place. You can transport knowledge anywhere. But I also saw that the language and the requirements that they were having were gonna be outside of my reach right now. Yes, I could take on investors and I'm big enough to do that, but I didn't want to. See, at the end of the day, I didn't want to. I don't do well with rules like that, like where someone else is ruling me via money. So I feel like my creative and artistic license that I bring to the cannabis industry would be stymied in some way. And so I didn't put my focus on like someone giving me money. I don't, I don't like that, that like the idea of that gave me hives. So that, um, that I mean, you know, Prop 64, I mean, everybody I know has taken some kind of super L on it. Like super, super L, it's kind of, terrible actually. I know so many people have lost farms. I know hash makers who just haven't made hash in over years. It's real messed up. It's real messed up. So that's how I feel about that. The amount of money I can make from any given situation does not ever play in. Because no matter what, money will come. Money will come. If you take the longer road, money will come. For example, you can get, I don't know now, but you can get like, if you went up to Humboldt, you can get um, trim, if you know the right people, 50 to $75 a pound. And it could be frosty and all kinds of things like that. But I can tell you, a good amount of those people are spraying. Not like using a big blanket to save those people. I'm saying a good amount of farmers I have met going up the mountain several times are spraying, which definitely is not going to make as good hash as if you're not spraying. But if I went and got that organic trim, it might cost me $250 to $300 a pound. I'm going to go with the organic trim every single time. Couple of reasons. I realize that it takes such a long time to build up a reputation, it takes two seconds. And anyone who knows of other hash makers, especially who crashed and burned last year, know that it takes two seconds to lose it all. So the idea of, of buying something cheap so that you can make more money, bad plan. The idea of going against your own principles, like for example, I grow organic um, material. I wash organic material. Right now, I'm washing something that's not organic, but I'm in the in no way saying, I'm not lying about it being organic. And I have to say that it has, it has given me some pause. And I've asked the company about that, like, when will you be moving to organic? And there's been a like, oh, we definitely have that on the, on the agenda because I recognize that I push an organic idea because it's better for the plant and it's better for the environment, it's better for our society as a whole. And that's important to me. Does it cost me a lot more money? Yes like a lot more money. Have I missed out on things because I wasn't just jumping on? Oh yes. But it's gonna bear out fine in the end. It's totally gonna bear out fine in the end. Like for example, you can make a lot of money, a, a pretty good amount of money, repping for companies on Instagram. You can definitely do that. If you have a big enough following, that is a way that people go. I mean, they, they might charge like between 150 and $300 per post. I don't rap for anybody at all for a couple reasons. One of them being like, if I don't know your business inside and out, I'm afraid that somehow it's gonna like bite me in the behind. And then like whatever little money I made there, then the, the amount that I'm gonna have to fix is not gonna be worth it. So there's one. Number two, a lot of these companies that want you to rep them are so far behind the actual rep in terms of marketing that like the amount that they're paying you is by no means proportionate to what light is being shed on the actual company. So if you have someone who has 150,000 followers that's getting $250 for this little post, that's ridiculous. So it's not really weighted as well to the actual model as anybody else. And the other thing is like, your morals just can't be for sale. That's just dumb. So for real, zero does the money come in. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. 
I do see concentrates being big. I do see hemp clothing being a big thing. Hemp fashion, I think it's going to be fashionable to be eco-conscious on the hemp side. So I'm happy about that. That's going to be better for the, for the world as a, as a whole. And global cannabis is going to make more inroads. We'll be seeing cannabis in places we haven't thought of. Like right now, I, I just found out that Zimbabwe has a medical marijuana program, and I'm really jazzed about that because my whole thing is I'd like to go to different countries and teach women in particular how to make bubble hash. I foresee that there will be the stock weed and then there will be the upper echelon weed. Hopefully the upper echelon weed will not be cost prohibitive. And the stock weed, I think, is a necessary. It's a necessary for me to predict that because there are huge companies with hundreds of thousands of square feet. Not like a little bit of square feet, but hundreds of thousands of square feet. Of it's not all monoculture, but I can understand from their standpoint if you need this square meter to make a certain amount of money, you're going to put Blue Dream in there. Blue Dream is a killer yielder and people like Blue Dream. But variety is the spice of life and people like exotics and people like something different. And so I feel that that's where the, the aficionado level will be. And then after that, you, you will have people who may appreciate good cannabis and then you will definitely have the bottom of the barrel where it's going to be, although tested, but nothing special, very much like you see in food. So that's, that's in terms of food and quality with that. I think we're gonna see some major breakthroughs in solventless extraction. Right now, we're in solventless diamonds as a counterpoint to solvent diamonds, which is a um, high THCA and sauce, it's, it's really, really exciting. Concentrates are going to continue to take over the market because concentrates are really convenient. You know, the ability to hit a pen and keep it moving is starting to trump the, the joint, especially for the group of people who don't want to smell like weed, who want to get their meds delivered to them super fast, super efficiently. They want to know, you know, I know two puffs is enough for me. They want to, to really distill that experience into something quantifiable. That's not gonna be my favorite person, but I think that's gonna, that, that's gonna happen. With regard to, um, Edibles, edibles is never my thing. I mean, as much as I smoke, I really can't consume edibles. But we're going to see rather than there being such a focus on sweet foods, you'll see a, a much, uh, you'll see movement into savory foods, different types of ethnic foods, because right now we're eating just like donuts and brownies. And, you know, we'll be seeing some kimchi with some cannabis oil, so that's, that's, that's gonna come around. Um, I, in terms of ancillary businesses, right now everything that's fun can be a little bit more fun with cannabis. So um, yeah, the guy that takes you on the history tour in Barcelona might take you on a history tour while you're high, and that is a whole different experience. So tourism is always big money. Tourism with cannabis is gonna be bigger money, bigger. But from a medical standpoint, I feel that more and more doctors are gonna get on board, more and more research facilities will find that there is money for studying cannabis because at the end of the day, it makes dollars and cents, and it makes sense. But you know, pharmaceuticals work on dollars and cents. So at the end of the day, it makes that. <laughs> There's still a lot of people who don't want to go to the dispensary. Dispensary prices are out of control. If an eighth is right now costing somewhere between $72 and $95, that's crazy. When you, if you know a grower, for one, you might get it for free. Or you get it for a reduced price. So the black market, I feel, is going to continue to be sustained while these prices are out of control. I mean, these are... Price is not even paid for in Florida. $80 eighth. What, what is that all about? So I think that the black market is going to have a good amount of, um, good amount of say, and a, a good portion is going to be taken up by the black market, mainly because the prices of the rec market are really astronomical and way out of the range of many. I mean, if I myself wasn't a grower, my average uh-oh is, 
is seven grams. So I'm looking at $160 per cigar. You are listening to Culture Interrupted. One of the best things about going to conferences is seeing the people you know, testing new, new products. And okay, I understand from a standpoint of quality assurance that the business that we have set up now with regards to quality assurance, that you can't allow everyone to smoke whatever. But in the country fair aspect, in the communal aspect of going to these events, to these sessions, there was a lot more feeling of family. Like now, the only people that you can buy um, their products at these conferences and places that you look forward to. Some people go to these conferences once a year and are on their farm the entire time. The only people you can have are now the licensed companies. So th the pool has shrunk by so much. And because the pool has shrunk by so much, the people who were making, the people who felt the incentive to push out the new flavors and to go that extra mile, which is not necessarily supported by the bottom line. See, at the end of the day, what craft growers do is not really supported by the bottom line. What I plan on doing on mixing sauce with bubble hash to see what that happens, that might be cost me like 50 grams that I'm playing around with. That is not supported by R&D, you know, that, that's not in the R&D budget for a big company who wants to see a, you know, a black across the line. That's not going to work out. But at the same time, we as the customer, we as the consumers, we as the people who appreciate cannabis, we lose out. We lose out because then it becomes a monoculture of that which is profitable. That's all. That's what cannabis is. Cannabis is now turning into that which is profitable. And if it's not profitable, hmm, too bad. So, oh my God, I'm like crying here. I'm sorry. I'm upset. <laughs> I mean, like, I guess I don't think about it like that, but when you think about it, it's like, I remember when you used to go to, like, a sesh, and, like, you just never knew what someone was coming with, what the experience was going to be like, but now, it's not like that. Now, if it's not made by a company that is licensed or whatever, and the thing is, a lot of these licensed companies, they have money, and yes, they might have a consultant like me come on board or whatever, but if you don't, at the end of the day, understand why people were willing to go to jail for this, why people were willing to die, and it only seems like the only green you care about is the dollars, then you're just never gonna get the best out of the plan, and you're just never gonna understand it. And you're always gonna be on the outside sounding like, it's so lit! And you're like, hmm, let's not use that word again, because they did. Within the cannabis industry, we deal with a lot of sexism. As a woman, as a hash maker, I mean, when I've gone places, now I'm more known, but when I've gone places in the beginning with my husband, people would talk to him, but he's not a hash maker. He doesn't make any hash. And they would talk to him, I'm just like, but this is my hash. And you would see them try to talk to me, and then they would gravitate. And then I really had to tell him to just leave, just leave. So now I'm the only person there, then they have to talk to me. Um, so I've dealt with a lot more sexism than I've dealt with racism. I've dealt with a little bit of that up the mountain, but I've definitely more of a situation of, there's some pettiness definitely within the cannabis industry. There's a, I, I don't know if it's a bit of a testosterone situation in terms of the fact that a lot of people are still young and feel the need to prove themselves in a way that is not really a good long-term strategy right now. It's all these memes going around, which I feel like like really eat at the culture of our connectedness. You know, I, I, I feel like it leads to a type of bullying and a type of ostracization that is bad for cannabis. Cannabis is about being inclusive. So if we can leave that competitiveness that is bordering on just com complete lack of empathy and feeling, and we can leave uh, sexism and any of the isms, we can leave those isms in the past, we can forge together with something really, really spectacular. Me dealing with cannabis in a holistic and mindful way is always at the forefront of my mind. So what I'm going to grow, you know, I'm not going to try to grow a 16-week variety in 11 weeks. That's five weeks that I'm not honoring plant where it should be, where I'm trying to do something. I'm not going to add any nutrients to speed it along or anything like that. I believe that cannabis is doing just fine without us, and I'm just appreciative that I can be within her circle. I think that the culture surrounding cannabis is incredibly important.
I, I do not feel like we have to make everything a, be about a fight against, you know? We can have a, a love in for rather than fighting against something. And our culture that we have created around cannabis, I feel like is flexible enough to let in different narratives that we haven't heard as yet. I think that's been a major thing. And so I shy away from whenever people say they want to rebrand cannabis, I really shy away from that because I feel like the, those words happen to come out of mouths that seek to sanitize cannabis as if the way cannabis was appreciated pre-legalization was somehow inferior to the way it's being appreciated now. Now it's sophisticated and before it was red eyes. Well, guess what? In your sophistication, you will still get red eyes if that weed is good. So I, while I did say that definitely this new uh, legislation has had an adverse effect in just about everybody that I know, these large scale companies are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. And no, we don't want to feel like we've sold our soul to the devils in any way. I do feel like growers councils that have a large portion of the board be small small time farmers. I feel like they will inform larger farmers on how they can keep in the spirit of cannabis, taking into consideration the people who have been there for the plant, have seen the ups and downs, indoor, outdoor, hydro, who basically have all of the knowledge that you could possibly imagine and are still learning those are the people that we need to learn from. And whether they were growing six plants or 6,000 plants, their knowledge is immeasurable because it all starts with the grower. Credit to the farmer. We appreciate you making the time to listen to Culture Interrupted. 